Good morning. My name is uh, Donald Wortman. I am uh, very proud to be a trustee of Cuca College and very pleased to be here this morning. Following on uh, Dr. Burke's announcement, Mary Ho asked me to announce to you that in the, in the printed program that you received, the next meeting after lunch is not in the governor's room. So Paul, you're hosting, the you're moderating the next meeting. It is here in the Cascade Ballroom. So after lunch, please come back here. If you go to the governor's room, we won't be there. <laughs> now, if you note in the um, program, I am the um, chief operating officer of a seed company. And as I was sitting here listening to the presentations earlier, I'm thinking to myself, this is very much like what I do, what we do. We plant seed. The difference is that you are planting seeds of recognition of each other, of cooperation, and also planting seeds of partnering. Now, if you never plant the seed, there's no plant. It doesn't grow. You have to plant it. And that's exactly what we trust is happening here. Now, we have the opportunity to hear our keynote speaker. I had the great uh, privilege and pleasure to have uh, breakfast with him this morning. He possesses many titles. Juris Doctor, Professor, Dean, President, Chancellor. But I also learned that there are some other descriptors that we should think about. Jeffrey Lehman is a futurist. He's an innovator. And as he told me, he's an optimist. Now these characteristics led Jeffrey Lehman to become the founding dean and currently the chancellor of Peking University School of Transnational Law. Now those of you who might be in the profession may have encountered the word transnational before. I hadn't. But I found that in speaking with uh, Jeffrey earlier today that my daughter is also in transnational law. I just didn't know it. <laughs> but as you see, Jeffrey Lehman has distinguished himself in his many roles as uh, a lawyer, as a professor, as dean of the law school at the University of Michigan, which is one of the top 10 in this country. He was the 11th president of Cornell University. And then, as he told me, as uh, this concept of a transnational law school was being formulated, he was called upon for advice and for information. And in addition to providing advice and information, he gave the names of 10 or so colleagues in his profession who he thought might be worthy uh, as uh, persons to be dean. Well, in the end, and history tells us that he became dean. And so uh, with the school three years into its existence and growing every year, and with the idea of becoming a, a major force in transnational law education, we are very pleased to have Jeffrey Lehman with us this morning as our keynote speaker. Please welcome him. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Don, for that very kind and generous introduction. It is a great honor for me to have been invited to speak at this leadership summit. 
Asahil and I were born in the same year, 1956. And so when I read and learned about how much Asahil has accomplished and how it and its member institutions continue to grow and prosper and innovate, I came to take it as kind of a model and a challenge that I welcome and admire. So thank you, Secretary General Olan Borovuth, and thank you, Brother Agriza, for including me within this family today. I'd also like to express my gratitude to President Burke for the hospitality that he and everyone associated with Cuca College have shown towards me during the planning of this summit. Cornell University and Cuca College share many things. We are both located in the Finger Lakes region of New York, which is certainly one of the most beautiful areas on earth. We are both committed to a vision of excellence and innovation in higher education. And I want to express my own personal admiration for the leadership that you have shown President Burke during your tenure as president of Cuca College. In particular, the work that you've done in Asia exemplifies the spirit of thoughtful engagement that I believe all universities should be pursuing, an engagement that is tailored to the particular strengths and priorities of Cuca College. My theme for this morning is a topic that has become the central commitment of my professional life. I want to speak with you about the role that universities can play in building bridges that unite people across national borders. My central message is quite simple and it is not especially novel, but I want to state it in the strongest possible terms. I believe that universities inevitably, automatically, and without even paying attention, help to create transnational bridges. I also believe, however, that we can do a much, much better job than we do of building those transnational bridges. To do so, however, we have to stop treating this bridge building as a mere byproduct of our work. I am saying that our universities should make it a central, explicit, explicit mission to help our students, our faculty, and our staff to become more effective transnational bridges. My claim is that if we do so, each and every one of our universities will be more successful at that mission, and we will thereby make a critical contribution to life on this planet in the 21st century. Now, I want to begin by making this argument by focusing first on some institutions that are not in the room with us today. As you all know, I am an American who lives and works at a university in China. For someone like me, and indeed for everyone here, it has become all too easy over the past two decades to become obsessed with the relationship between Asia and America. Asia and America, America and Asia. This is the crucial axis of innovation, design, production, distribution, consumption. How well this relationship develops will determine how well the world goes in the future. We say this all the time. We say it to ourselves, we say it to everyone else. I think it is as dangerous for us to fall into this kind of thinking today as it was for Americans to have fallen into a kind of North Atlantic obsession in the 20th century. So to counteract that danger, let me begin by reminding us all of a fact that everyone here knows. Universities, our beloved universities, did not begin in America and they did not begin in Asia. The world's first universities began as explicitly religious endeavors in North Africa and Europe. The Madrasa of al karouin was founded in Morocco in the year 859 
as a center of Muslim teaching. It is now called the University of al Karawin and is often said to be the oldest university that has been continuously in existence since its founding. 100 years later, the Madrasa of Al-Azhar, now called the University of Al-Hazar, was begun in Egypt. And 100 years after that, in 1065, the Madrasa Al-Nizamiyah of Baghdad was begun. Shortly thereafter, a critical group of institutions, Christian institutions, were begun in Europe. The University of Bologna in 1088, and Oxford and the University of Paris in 1096. Now, if we want to think about how universities can create cross-national bridges, it is worth observing that even these first North African and European universities gave people a reason to travel. It was natural for universities to attract scholars from great distances, even from across political borders. Pioneer in this domain was actually the University of Prague. That university insisted very early that its students should be admitted only on the basis of their academic merit. And so by the early 1400s, almost half of its 4,000 students were foreigners. Of course, even from the very beginning, political leaders were unsure about this university-stimulated border crossing. I have a feeling the same political leaders administer our visa and immigration policies here. Frederick Barbarossa, the German leader of the Holy Roman Empire, invested in supporting students' efforts to study at faraway universities, provided that the students promised to work for the church or the state after they finished their studies. Others, like King Henry II of England, were so worried about brain drain that they absolutely prohibited their young people from traveling to foreign schools. And this is how it was for almost 1,000 years, from 859 until the early 1800s. These early universities and their descendants in America, like Harvard and Yale, were platforms for a certain kind of cross-border mobility. But it should also be stressed that they were rather narrow platforms. They did not look like modern universities. Their goal was a particular kind of teaching goal. Their aim was to prepare proper men to be leaders of the church. They taught religion, medicine, law, and what came to be known as a liberal education or a classical education Latin, Greek, mathematics, philosophy, history, and music. The theory underlying this view of a university was expressed brilliantly in a series of lectures in 1852 by Cardinal John Newman entitled The Idea of a University. Yet even at the time that Cardinal Newman delivered his famous speeches, the idea of a university had begun to expand. And as the idea of a university grew during the 19th century, so did its potential significance as a border crossing platform. The initial center for change was in Germany. In 1820, the University of Berlin was founded and it had a different mission. In the view of its president, Wilhelm von Humboldt, teachers should be more than just teachers. They should be scholars who conducted original research that advanced the frontiers of human knowledge. The university's mission was to provide the environment in which they could conduct that research, an environment committed at its core to a principle of academic freedom whereby researchers could choose what to study for themselves and to express their findings 
without fear that the German authorities would punish them. The new German research university proved to have even greater power than the teaching universities that preceded it to attract people across national borders. Students from around the world rushed to Germany to study there. And Germany would remain the world center for university education for almost a century until the attractive power of the research university was counteracted by the even more repugnant power of Adolf Hitler. Now for the history of higher education, two of the most important people who were drawn to Germany by the University of Berlin were a pair of Americans, two young friends who had been undergraduate classmates together at Yale. Their names were Andrew Dixon White and Daniel Coit Gilman. After they completed their studies in Germany, these two young men went back to America and became the founding presidents of two new universities that reflected German ideas about higher education. In 1865, Andrew Dixon White became the first president of Cornell University. White's partner in the creation of the university was a businessman named Ezra Cornell. And the two of them created a university that was revolutionary in two ways. Ezra Cornell summarized this revolutionary ambition with the phrase that Cornell should be an institution where any person could find instruction in any study. Now when Ezra Cornell spoke of any person, he was signaling that unlike other universities, Cornell would be open to men and women of all races and all religions. And when he spoke of any study, he signaled that unlike other universities, Cornell would be committed to teaching practical subjects such as engineering and agriculture alongside the classics. Cornell would be a bigger platform, both in terms of the people it would teach and the subjects it would teach. In 1876, Andrew Dixon White's close friend Daniel Coit Gilman became the first president of Johns Hopkins University. And he defined the central mission of that university to be research, the advancement of knowledge. And he insisted that strong research would improve the quality of teaching. And so he organized Hopkins to be primarily a center of graduate level study focused on the PhD degree. Now over the course of the succeeding century, Cornell's commitment to being a university open to all kinds of students and all kinds of study, and Johns Hopkins' commitment to being a research university, would become accepted as the central defining principles of the most famous American universities. And during the 20th century, these American universities replaced German universities as the most influential bridges in the world of higher education. They became more and more powerful magnets, drawing students and faculty from around the world to cross national borders to come to America. During the early 1930s, about 10,000 foreign students enrolled in American universities in a typical year. By 1955, that number had more than tripled. It was up to 36,000 students. By 1963, it was 75,000 students. And in 2009, 2010, it was almost 700,000 students. Now this expanding flow of students from overseas has had an important impact on the demographic composition of American campuses, especially when it comes to graduate level education. American universities have today, more and more, come to see themselves the way the University of Prague saw itself 600 years ago, as homes for talent, no matter where in the world that talent may have been born. 
1972, American universities gave 15% of their doctoral degrees to citizens of other countries. By 1990, that percentage had grown to 26%. In the sciences, it was more than 50%. And the number has continued to grow since then. Now, I'll come back to this narrative in, in a moment, but I want to make one digression here on the subject of economic theory and its limitations. You see, simple economic theory might have predicted that higher education in the age of globalization would have evolved in one way. And it is quite noticeable that, in fact, higher education in the age of globalization has not gone in that direction. In the 1800s, the economist David Ricardo developed his brilliant theory of globalization and international trade. Under Ricardo's theory, the reduction of barriers to trade leads countries to specialize in areas where they have what is called a comparative advantage. So instead of each country trying to do everything from farming to computer programming, each country would specialize in a few areas. One country would become the world's food supplier, another would become the world's automobile manufacturer, etc. Now, Ricardo's theory is, of course, brilliant, and it continues to provide the essential intellectual underpinning for our modern period of economic globalization. But as brilliant as his theory is, it is crucial that we appreciate its limits. So if one were simple-minded about it, one might think that Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage should operate naturally in the world of higher education. And one might therefore have thought that it would be natural and even appropriate for America to become the world's university, the place where all teaching and research would happen, while other countries specialized in other kinds of economic activity. But over the past two decades, we have seen an emphatic rejection of this approach. Around the world, countries have reaffirmed the strategic centrality of their universities. Unlike a factory which can produce a certain kind of jobs and profits, a university is different. Universities can produce vast public benefits. Because universities are natural platforms for transnational migration, they can be magnets that pull talented people into a community. And once those talented people are in the community, they can create new ideas that help to spur the local economy, and perhaps just as importantly, can help to advance the non-economic aspects of a society. So over the last few decades, in Europe, in Asia, in the Middle East, governments have said, wait, let us look at the German Research University, let's see how it was improved in America, and let's see how we might adapt it and improve it in our own countries. Perhaps the most visible and most discussed examples have come in Saudi Arabia and to some extent in China. But significant efforts can be identified all around the world, efforts to improve quality, efforts to reward competitive excellence, efforts to develop strong international partnerships, efforts to make English the primary language of intellectual and scientific interactions. The global flow of students across national borders has continued to accelerate, but it is not just about America. Higher education accounted for 36% of Australia's service exports in 2009-2010, 36%. Last year, 80% of the students outside the United States who left their home countries to, to study at a university chose to study in a country other than America, 80%. All of these trends, I believe, are for the good. My central point, however, this morning is that 
we, as universities all around the world, as societies all around the world, are missing a tremendous opportunity if we think that the benefits of transnational interactions on university campuses will come to us, as it were, by accident. To capture those benefits for our institutions and for our societies, we need to take conscious and affirmative action. Last year, Ben Wildofsky published a wonderful book called The Great Brain Race, How Global Universities Are Reshaping the World. And I approve of much of what Wildofsky says in that book, but I believe that at its core, it is seriously incomplete. Wildofsky first focuses his attention on the contributions that great universities make to their home country's economic competitiveness. He says that the reason why, univer why countries should invest in their universities is that, quote, economic growth and global competitiveness are increasingly driven by knowledge, and universities can play a key role in that knowledge. Great students will keep more students, great universities will keep more students at home, perhaps attract more from abroad, and above all, create innovative and prosperous economies. Wildofsky then quotes the leader of South Korea's new program to facilitate global academic partnerships, who says, quote, our focus is on supporting new growth-generating technologies that will spearhead national development. Wildofsky then turns his attention to the idea that international education experiences for students are less a matter of seeking new cultural or linguistic experiences than simply of finding the best available scholarly brand. In this discussion, Wildofsky suggests that what matters for the student is to get the best possible credential and to get plugged into the best possible network of fellow alumni. He, he describes the world as becoming a world of academic free trade, where student and faculty talent of all kinds move smoothly around the world unless governments choose to interfere with the natural process of what he calls talent-based mobility. So let me be clear, it's not that I disagree with Wildofsky's general direction. I do believe that great universities contribute to economic growth and development. I do believe that knowledge is becoming key to that process. And I do believe it is good for talent to move freely around the world. But I have problems with what is missing from Wildofsky's story. And my problems here are similar to the problems that I have with Tom Friedman's enormously influential book, The World is Flat. I dare say everyone in this room has read The World is Flat, and so you're all aware of Mr. Friedman's contention that technological change has pretty much eliminated the significance of distance and national boundaries. And I dare say that we can all agree that technology has made the world flatter than it used to be. Technology has made it less expensive and faster to collaborate around the world. But has it made the world completely flat? Of course not. Anyone who works with a business that crosses national borders will tell you immediately that the answer is no. Culture still matters. Now, again, let me be clear. On almost all the really big, really important things when it comes down to deep value questions, I do not believe that cultural differences matter at all. People are people. They want to avoid physical and emotional pain. They want to enjoy pleasure. They want to love and to be loved. In every culture, people are not supposed to hurt each other. People are supposed to be honest and follow the rules. 
But different cultural traditions matter enormously when it comes to the question of how people are expected to show respect for these really big value questions when they go about living their daily lives. A very interesting psychological literature has emerged over the last decade and documented how children who start out the same can develop very different cognitive patterns by growing up in different cultures. They can actually perceive things differently because when they were growing up, they were taught different answers to the question, what matters? What is important in this situation? Interest in this field was accelerated with the publication in 2003 of the book, The Geography of Thought by Richard Nisbet, a psychologist at the University of Michigan. The book is filled with provocative examples drawn from rigorous psychological experiments. And these examples tend to support the conclusion that people from Asian cultures tend in their observations of the world to focus more on the characteristics of objects that relate those objects to their context, whereas people from Western cultures tend to focus more on the characteristics of objects that do not change if the object is moved from one context to another. Let me give you another example of a culture-based difference, one that I stumbled on accidentally in the course of my work in China. This example has to do with how Americans and Chinese people deal with units of time. If you were to ask an American what day tomorrow is, 99% of them would say it's Tuesday. If you were to ask a Chinese person, 99% of them would say it's the 21st. For Americans, the most important time interval is a week. For Chinese, it's a month. So if one of my Chinese colleagues says to one of my American colleagues, why don't we get together on the 24th? Throws the American for a loop. The American stops, calculates, and says, do you mean Friday? <laughs> and if one of my American colleagues says to one of my Chinese colleagues, so let's get together for coffee on Thursday, the typical response of my Chinese colleague is to say, uh, you mean the 23rd? Now, I love this example because neither culture attaches any moral significance to which period of time you use most often. Once people understand this difference, it's very easy to overcome it. Americans can learn to frame things according to the day of the month without any emotional anxiety. Chinese can learn to frame things according to the day of the week in the same way. But other cultural differences are more difficult. They have value judgments attached to them. To a Chinese person, it might be disrespectful to express a disagreement directly, especially to someone who is in a position of authority. To an American, it might be equally disrespectful to fail to express a disagreement especially if the situation is one where the authority figure really needs to know if people agree or disagree. Now, I want to stipulate that there is something a little bit discomforting about this view of the world that says cultures matter. Many people are made quite uncomfortable by the suggestion that culture, the way that people are raised from birth until adulthood, can shape the way they think, shape the way they perceive their environments. When I was a college student in the 1970s, people who talked about things like national character were sometimes dismissed as closet racists. More recently, 
when I was a defendant in a lawsuit involving affirmative action in law school admissions, it made people extremely uncomfortable to suggest that cultural backgrounds might affect people's perceptions of such nat natural domains as science. So I want to encourage all of you to explore this fascinating literature on cultural differences, to explore it critically, and to draw your own conclusions about whether and how much cultural differences matter. But for right now, I want to ask you to take as an assumption that I'm right, that they do matter at least some of the time. And I ask you to think with me about what the implications of that assumption might be. One positive implication is that these cultural differences offer us an enormous potential benefit waiting to be tapped. In a world where technology makes it easier for people to work in diverse teams across great distances, there is a tremendous opportunity for businesses, certainly, but also for the non-business aspects of society as well. Culturally diverse teams could have the ability to see issues in more complex, subtle, and I would say accurate ways because the members of those teams would bring different perspectives to every problem. And the group could then integrate those different perspectives in ever more powerful ways. But this tremendous potential benefit comes linked indissolubly to a tremendous problem. To realize this benefit, we have to assume that this culturally diverse group of individuals can come together and transcend their differences to produce a richer and more subtle group analysis. But that assumption will be manifestly false if members of a diverse team are unable to work together because of cross-cultural misunderstanding. In the years ahead, I believe that one of the most valuable skills that any person can have is the ability to help culturally diverse groups to work well together to recognize cross-cultural misunderstandings and to help teams to get past them. That set of skills are what I call the skills of the bridge person. An effective bridge person must have three qualities. He or she must be able to see the world from his own culture's perspective and also from that of a different culture. Second, he or she must be able to engage sympathetically with all perspectives without rushing to say that one perspective is right and the other perspective is wrong. And third, he or she must be able to explain how the cross-cultural misunderstanding occurred in a way that allows everyone to understand it, to appreciate it, to work towards a transcendent solution without feeling that they have lost face. Now, I submit to you that the skills of the effective bridge person are higher order skills than, say, the ability to run at least squares regression. They are important for more than their ability to yield discrete outcomes in a particular case. The skills of the effective bridge person are catalytic. They are technologies that drive new kinds of processes. They multiply the force that any individual can bring to bear on any given problem. 
And that ultimately brings me back to the role of the university. I would submit that we are failing in our responsibilities if we simply assume that the students and faculty and staff who inhabit our ever more diverse campuses will become effective bridge people by accident, simply because our communities are more diverse than they once were. I would submit that it is not enough for us to assume that by putting together a class that includes Asians and Europeans, Africans and Americans, we will have prepared them to make the kinds of contributions that the 21st century needs them to make. We need to take the bull by the horns. We need to step forward and assert that every student who passes through our doors will be actively and explicitly helped to think about cultural differences. We need to step forward and assert that every member of our community will become ever more thoughtful about when such differences are irrelevant and when they matter greatly. So let me be candid here. Today, right now, we do not know how to deliver on this promise. The research on cultural differences is still developing. It is really still in its infancy. Even more importantly, our understanding about how to turn that research into pedagogic practice is truly primitive. We need to understand much more completely than we do today how to work with diverse groups so as to maximize each individual's understanding of cultural difference. Even more, we need to understand much more completely than we do today what techniques, what teaching techniques are most effective in helping heterogeneous groups to interpret and transcend difference and mutual misunderstanding. We need to understand, finally, what mix of didactic instruction and practice-based experience can produce the most effective bridge people possible. People who are able both to diagnose culture-based misunderstanding and treat it. People are able, who are able both to recognize opportunities for deeper multi-perspective-based understanding and to help a group to realize those opportunities. But please consider the possibilities that await us if we choose to direct our institutions towards this new horizon. Modern, transnational universities will do more than just provide any person instruction in any subject. They will do more than just conduct path-breaking research. They will become the fertile soil in which multicultural bridge people are planted, are nourished, and blossom. Our university students, faculty, and staff can all become known as the kind of people who make multicultural teams effective. They can be bridges around the world, pathways that enable the peoples of our planet to work together in close cooperation using their separate and complementary strengths together to solve the most difficult challenges that face human beings in the 21st century. Thank you very much. The schedule does not call for questions Q&A, but it appears as though we have just a few minutes. Does anyone wish to uh, ask uh, Jeffrey Lehman a uh, question relative to his comments or anything else you may consider relevant. If you, if you do, please speak up. So uh, the, the, the question was, how do I distinguish between international and transnational? This derives from uh, my background in law and legal education. Um, the term uh, international law in legal education was described, uh, was defined uh, long ago 
to concern the relationship between nations. Uh, so it was the law that governed the relationship between nations. And so more than 50 years ago, a great scholar named Philip Jessup uh, started to uh, emphasize the use of transnational to define the much broader set of processes, the much broader set of circumstances in which laws look across national borders and affect people in other countries. So the fact that uh, people around the world are affected by American law, American securities law, American antitrust law, uh, makes American law a kind of transnational law. The fact that we are all affected by uh, European com community, uh, competition law makes competition law a kind of transnational law. We're all affected by the WTO, and that is another kind of transnational law. None of these are international law in the traditional sense. And so transnational came into my consciousness through law, and I came to actually appreciate it as uh, a word that more effectively describes uh, this notion of transcending na nations, transcending the Westphalian nation state, uh, and moving uh, to think about a world where the dominant uh, structures are the planet and the individual rather than the nation state. It doesn't mean that we eliminate nations. We're all at some level still grounded we all have citizenship in one or two countries, uh, but uh, we begin to think of ourselves as transcending our nations in some ways, as thinking our, of ourselves as uh, affiliated with our own nations, but at the same time transcending that affiliation and becoming deeply linked to one another regardless of our national affiliation. So uh, the question was uh, that one of the uh, corollaries of the existence of cultural differences is that sometimes uh, you see the phenomenon of members of one cultural group uh, thinking themselves superior to members of different cultural groups. They believe that their approach to perceiving the world uh, is stronger and better. Uh, than that uh, of people who are outsiders to that group. Um, I guess I would amend the question just by changing the word sometimes to always. Uh, I don't think uh, I have ever met anyone uh, who says, uh, my, culture, my culture is inferior. Um, uh, as I've traveled around the world, I've spent a lot of time in a variety of cultures. I was born in America. I spent a lot of time in France. I spent a lot of time in China. Uh, none of these cultures would uh, take a backseat to any other culture. And in fact, uh, people in each of the three cultures uh, will often uh, insist uh, that their culture is the best. And I think um, that uh, simply recognizing that fact uh, is already uh, an important first step. Um, because it then uh, can lead people to ask themselves, why? Why is it that we feel this deep-seated need to define the culture that we happen to have been born into by accident of birth as somehow inherently superior uh, to other cultures? Uh, can't we take a step back and be more curious and ask, what is it that gives this other culture, which has survived for hundreds or thousands of years, the kind of durability, the kind of power that it has in fact acquired? We don't live in a world with one culture. Uh, even if Hollywood might like to create one for us. Um, that is a source of great strength. Uh, for humanity, but I think it's actually important to elevate your observation to the foreground and say, hmm, where does this impulse come from, uh, this need to define uh, who we are as somehow superior? I think only if we confront that impulse directly 
do we have much of a chance of them being able to transcend it?